for future webinars, then just either get in touch with Stu Waugh or follow community engagement on Twitter. And during the session, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions in the chat box, but also at the end of the presentation, and we'll have someone monitoring the chat box throughout. I hope you enjoy the session today. It's certainly one I'm looking forward to. So to start us off, I'd just like to hand over to Lauren. Lauren, thanks and welcome. Thank you and thank you for having us today. I'm just going to share some slides. Hi everyone, I'm Lauren Toothley. I'm a consultation and engagement advisor at NHS Grampian and I'm at uh, aligned to the Baird and Anchor project. So today we, first of all, I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction to the project and our approach to engagement and tell you a bit about the story so far. I'll then hand over to Gail Thompson, who is our Deputy Project Director, and she's going to take you through uh, the Baird Family Hospital section. We're going to hopefully, if technology allows, show a fly through video and she's going to speak about some engagement examples. And then Louise Ann Budge, our service and commissioning project manager, she's going to do the same for the Anchor Centre. And then we will do a lessons learned um, and hopefully have plenty of time for questions at the end. So all three of us like to talk, so I am going to get started. So we've got plenty of time. So what is the Beard and Anchor project? It's two new facilities on the Forest Hill Health Campus in Aberdeen. The Anchor Centre is accommodation for day patient and outpatient oncology and haematology services. And it'll have an aseptic pharmacy on site as well, which can produce chemotherapy on site. The Beard Family Hospital uh, will provide accommodation for neonatal maternity services, reproductive breast and gynaecology services. It's the biggest capital project in Scotland at the minute, coming in at £233.2 million. And both buildings will provide um, services not just for Grampian, but for the north of Scotland and the Northern Ireland as well. And this was really important um, when we were in the consultation phase because it was services not just for patients in Grampian. It was vital to engage with patients and families from the likes of Orkney and Shetland as well to make sure we found out what they needed um, from services and what they would want from new buildings. And the buildings are due to be operational, um, likely the Anchor Centre in 2023 and the Beard Family Hospital in 2024. <coughs> Excuse me. So where the story begins, um, way back um, in 2010, before 2010, sorry, there was a maternity consultation. And from that consultation, a new maternity strategy was produced in 2010. And that strategy identified the need for a new maternity hospital, um, as well as local choice. So um, community maternity units have also been built in that time to give local choice as well. So we knew we needed a replacement for the Aberdeen Maternity Hospital because the building that we currently have is no longer fit for purpose. Um, and the anchor services were identified as an NHS Grampian priority to improve accommodation. Stage one of that plan was the radiotherapy centre, and that was completed on the Forest Hill site in 2013. And as part of that, um, there was a stage two discussed, and in the radiotherapy centre outlined business case, stage two would be a facility that provided outpatient, day patient, um, would have academic and research facilities, was, was the aim. And fast forward um, almost 10 years, and we're finally building the anchor centre. Um, the project was also compliant with all relevant national, regional and local clinical care and health strategies. And there was a strong strategic case that could be made for the Bearded Anchor project, proceeding as one project, but delivering two buildings. And that announcement was made in late 2014. And then in 2015, the project team was established and the planning commenced. So a huge amount of consultation work started in 2015. And that first year, really, all we did was talk. We just spoke to lots and lots of different people um, and the obviously it took until December 2020 before building work started. So obviously a huge amount of work in that time. Um, during 
that time we and we continue to do so we followed the skim guidance so the scottish capital investment manual and for anyone that's not familiar um, with this guidance it's a comprehensive guidance that covers the whole life cycle of a capital project from service planning to your initial agreement right through your business case um, stages to construction and then to your post project evaluation um, and that is the the life cycle that we have continued to follow and are still are still working on and we've had stakeholders involved um, since 2015 and they have been involved throughout the whole life cycle of the project so our approach to engagement um, engagement was identified as one of our first priorities um, and the importance, I think, was realised um, partly by having a dedicated public involvement resource. So we knew how much communication and engagement there would be around the project. So um, when the project team was being set up, it was identified that there would be a dedicated resource 20 hours a week um, to support the project. But uh, thankfully, it's, it's not just all on me um, to do all the communication and engagement. It's part of the whole team's role. Um, and there's a real ethos in the Beard and Anchor team um, that everyone sees the importance of communication and engagement. And most of 2015 was spent, like I say, talking in joint workshops. Um, and I think this is so important, it's been key to our success that we had all stakeholders round the one table. Um, and everyone was part of the same discussion, hearing the conversations firsthand. And I really believe that's led to a mutual understanding from the different, from the, the sides that the different stakeholders were coming from. We agreed patient and service need before looking at any kind of building plans or what the buildings may look like. So when we finally met with architects in 2016, we already had a clear understanding and what our patient and service needs were from a build, from new buildings. Um, our approach to engagement has um, included a communication and engagement strategy. So um, we wrote that at the very start of the project and we have reviewed our strategy at the different stages of the project to make sure that our strategy is still relevant to the stage of the project that we're at, it's still up to date. Um, same with our stakeholder analysis, it was carried um, out at our service planning stage and throughout the life cycle of the project has been updated to make sure that we are still you know, adding to it if there's new groups coming on um, that we became aware of. Um, so continue to make sure that that's kept up to date. And the benefits realisation plan, so it was carried out at the initial agreement stage. And we um, surveyed patients, families, staff, um, to see what benefits they would want from new buildings. And then what we do, we've got all of that data collated, and then what we do as part of our post-project evaluation, um, we'll go back and see if those benefits have been realised. The other thing that we do on a six monthly basis, we have an action plan that details all of our communication and engagement activities, and um, that just keeps us on track depending on what stage of the project is to make sure that we are um, carrying out all the tasks that we need to. We've also had an um, active staff engagement programme throughout the project. Um, and I think one key thing that we realised with staff engagement, like our stakeholders, um, is that we have tried to go to staff and existing meetings and committees instead of asking staff to come to us we've gone to them and um, because a lot of the staff that we're engaging with are clinical staff so they obviously have clinical roles so we don't want to take up more of their time than we need to um, an important point to note is that the 233.2 million investment is to improve services not just about providing buildings so there's been lots of re service redesign work going on as part of the Beard and Anchor project as well But our approach um, hasn't always worked and um, we established a communication group um, at the start of the project and I had done this approach in previous capital projects and it had worked well. Um, but we realised quite quickly that our attendance was low, so we needed to rethink why um, people weren't wanting to come to our communication group. 
And it wasn't that they weren't interested in the project. It was because our stakeholders were part of charities or community groups that already had existing networks and meetings. So they didn't want to come to yet another meeting. So we changed our approach and we went to them instead. Um, now, it's worth noting, obviously, this is more time consuming because instead of inviting everyone to one meeting, you know, you're going to various groups um but we believe that it is definitely been beneficial doing it that way and it's the project ethos now is to take communication to the stakeholder and for us it's been um, a real success doing it that way um also um making sure the right team member goes to the audience so making sure whoever you're sending from the team is able to answer that audience's questions um is really important um, we go, obviously, like I say, to charities and support groups. Um, so I guess when you're planning to do this, it's also about realising the time and effort it takes to do this well. And um, we've made, obviously, we've been working on this project for so many years, we've made really good relationships. And it's not just been a one off, you know, we'll go to a support group once. We have continued to do it throughout the project. So it's realising that the time that it takes to do this well. Um, Staff I mentioned before, like I said, making sure that you've got different approaches to suit your different staff groups and making sure that you're where possible. It's not always possible because we have to arrange meetings to specifically discuss, you know, Baird and Anchor, but making sure that um, you're going to existing staff meetings so you're not asking them for more time out of their busy schedules. And um, we received positive Scottish Government feedback. Um, for our communication and engagement activities, um, are they were commended? So that was really good um, for us, making you know recognising that we were our approach was the right thing to do. Obviously, like everyone, we have um, adapted for COVID times. Um, so Beard and Anchor started being built in December 2020, and. We'd been quiet publicly um, for about a year just with getting the final contract signed. So we decided that we needed some kind of relaunch um, to, again, raise awareness and create a buzz about the building work actually starting. But because of COVID restrictions, we obviously couldn't have the more traditional on-site launch event. So we had a virtual launch for the project. Um, and I won't go into lots of detail about it. I could probably do a whole session just on the virtual launch, but uh, we designed it. It was a um, online platform that was designed to look like a hospital building. And we had some of the content you'll see today, the fly through videos, and we had patient stories and information about our um, construction and fundraising partners. Um, and it was really well um, received. And um, the beauty of doing a virtual launch is that people could watch it anywhere, anytime. So the reach was much wider than a one-off event would be. And again, like everyone else, we've continued our engagement um, throughout COVID with our stakeholders, but it's all been virtual. Um, so at least we've not, you know, we've not lost that relationships that we've built for years. We've, we've, we've maintained them virtually. Right, I'm going to hand over now to Gail. So Gail, just let me know when you're ready. Yes, thank you. Yes, uh, I'm, hi, I'm Gail. I'm the Deputy Project Director. Um, I'm going to speak to you about Baird uh, specifically, and we're going to show you a fly through at uh, first. Um, I'm hoping technology will work uh, beautifully. It's about five minutes of an illustrative um, guide uh, through the Baird, uh, which will give you a feel for what we're trying to create in the building. Uh, and as we're uh, going through, I'll particularly try and um, use my uh, narrative uh, to speak about uh, stakeholder engagement and how that's influenced the design of the building. So if you're ready to hit the play button, Lauren, let's fingers crossed. This is the nervous bit where we worry about the technology. Stop sharing for one minute because I'm just <laughs> checking my sound is on. Uh, I'll just keep talking until it, until it appears. We've got uh, Margaret Meredith, our project nurse, uh, is going to do a brief introduction uh, and this will be in the pack of the virtual launch materials that uh, you'll be sent separately to enjoy at your leisure because there's also patient and family videos and stories in there as part of our uh, patient engagement. Um, so as I say it's been a very useful tool to us to take to oh I'm going to stop talking because hopefully Margaret's going you'll hear Margaret in a moment. This is Margaret Meredith and I'm project nurse for the Baird Family Hospital. 
I'm delighted to present this fly through of the Baird, which will illustrate the main areas of this new facility. The Baird will accommodate breast, gynaecology, maternity, neonatal and reproductive services and will be a resource for Grampian and the north of Scotland. Our aim is to create a truly family centred facility which will support women and families as they experience the joy of having a baby. The Baird has also been designed to support and to be sensitive to the needs of patients and families who undergo journeys that are less positive. Our overall ethos is to create a building that is non-clinical and welcoming to all who will use the facility, including our hardworking staff. We are very proud that we have achieved the final design in full consultation with our patient, charity and staff stakeholders. I do hope that you enjoy this fly through and on behalf of NHS Grampian and the project team, thank you for watching. Okay, I'm hoping, can you, you can all still hear me? Great, uh, I'm going to talk quite fast. Some bits of the fly through do go quite fast, uh, but you'll see the, the size uh, of the Baird Family Hospital there going into uh, quite a tight corner of the Forest Hill Health Campus. As Margaret said in her introduction, a, a lot of our stakeholder and staff engagement was about the desire to have quite an interest in building, but we're appropriate uh, for it to be non-clinical uh, and feel uh, where we could. Um, so there's the, the main entrance area as you come in uh, as welcoming an intuitive sign uh, and wayfinding as, as possible uh, with self-check-in uh, opportunities which all, uh, 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 patients said they were wanted to have as technology. You'll see some illustrations there of our interior design um, where again it would add to that non-clinical feel that we're trying to achieve as much as possible even in rooms as you can see there which is a uh, consulting and examination room. We want to make it um, as as relaxing uh, a building as possible, obviously, for people going through sometimes some quite anxious um, experiences. So art and interior design will be an important part of what we're trying to achieve in, in both buildings. Uh, full height um, atrium, and that will give us a lot of social uh, spaces and opportunities for uh, pa women and patients to enjoy and have a cup of coffee before they go uh, through to uh, mainly an outpatient uh, experience on this floor. Uh, we have a community maternity unit that I think the fly through is going to take you through just now. Uh, so we have um, engaged uh, quite a bit with uh, women about um, uh, their experiences of uh, maternity services and particularly in the CMU as you'll see in a moment it's a very non-clinical feel we're obviously aiming to go for even though you've got uh, a birthing pool in there so we have enhanced increased birthing pool provision and um, again in response to the fact we have one birthing pool in the maternity hospital at the moment uh, but that again that non-clinical hotel almost type feel uh, and you get a good view there of the, the atrium and those social spaces uh, that will be created. It does go quite fast, I'm afraid. Here we go, up on the first floor. Uh, this will take you into the neonatal unit. Our neonatal unit is now amazing clinical service, but really small uh, spaces. Where you're seeing there is one cot space where at the moment we would have potentially three or four babies. And, and as you can imagine, very, very limited space currently for families to actually feel comfortable. Um, at the side of their baby and, and feel they're not tripping up the staff. So that's a huge space in the beard. And this, uh, these rooms, 10 ad adjacent transitional care rooms uh, where families uh, can be looking after their baby potentially before they're just taking them home after uh, uh, perhaps been in the unit for, for some weeks or months. Um, so again, that non-clinical uh, hotel comfortable feel um, as much as possible for uh, families to enjoy while their babies are are in the unit and going through uh, quite a range of emotions while their babies in the unit. Um, here we go. Uh, I think we're going to go into the birthing suite next. So this community maternity unit uh, on the ground floor is for um, lower risk uh, women on the green pathway. On the birthing suite, it is by nature a more clinical feel, but even there you can see big rooms that will try uh, with art and interior design to make as welcoming as possible. and plenty of space for family members to be with women. That came through loud and clear that that's a definite limitation on the uh, maternity hospital accommodation that we have at the moment. So that whole family ethos uh, that we're trying to create for the whole building. We have six theatres in the Baird. 
uh, obviously do have to be very clinical, uh, but um, again, big spaces on uh, new healthcare standards and um, uh, space, obviously, particularly in the obstetric theatres for uh, a partner uh, or husband to be uh, with the woman, as we have just now. And then we have these atrium um, bedrooms that look out onto the atrium. And we did some specific patient engagement work where we went into the wards in the maternity hostel and ran some architect sketches past women who were in the maternity hostel to give get a feel for, uh, for the design features that we wanted in those rooms that I think will actually turn out to be quite interesting. The second floor is the main inpatient floor for breast, gynaecology and maternity. It's 100% single rooms uh, and the biggest benefit for that uh, particularly is um, uh, privacy and the size uh, of the rooms in the maternity hospital. At the moment you could have four or five um, bedded um, ward areas where uh, we kick partners out at night uh, because of uh, privacy for other patients. 100% single rooms with big family spaces uh, will be provided in the Baird. And then a really important critical part of the Baird is the patient hotel on the top floor. I'll explain a little bit more about that in the presentation, uh, but this will be used to support women from uh, remote areas who might be coming here to have their uh, baby four weeks. Um, they can't fly uh, in the last four weeks before they have their baby if they're coming from Orton and Shetland and to support uh, families who have a baby in the neonatal unit. So uh, that definitely not a, a, um, a luxury, it's a definite and essential part of the beard. And then this is an important main entrance for the beard, but at the other side of the hospital where, again, through feedback from patients, particularly attending reproductive medicine, it gives us that uh, privacy of um, and discretion of entrance and exit to the hospital. That came through uh, very clearly from uh, patient and staff engagement. Sorry, I did uh, have to talk quite fast over that. Some of it's quite quick. Uh, well, hopefully that'll give you a feel for, we'll be delighted if our hospital uh, looks uh, like that. Uh, but you can hopefully see uh, from that and the examples we're able to give you of the influence that our stakeholders have had in the design. Uh, so we've got a few more slides um, to show you, um, specifically about the Baird engagement then, just to tell you a little bit about just some examples. Um, of engagement for staff and uh, women and patients that we've done uh, and why we've done it and who we've spoken to you and the methods of how we engage with people. Uh, my other examples are about uh, women and patients, but I thought I better start about staff first. So we do a lot of staff uh, engagement and chatting, as Lauren's already said. This is our gynaecology team, very, very active, enthusiastic team who are uh, very keen to redesign uh, the service before we move even to the beard. So they've done quite a bit of engagement directly with patients uh, of the gynaecology service, particularly around procedures such as hysteroscopies that would have traditionally been done in a theatre setting. Um, but actually, uh, with a bit of service redesign, uh, we've moved that quite successfully to an outpatient ambulatory setting. So uh, patient, direct patient feedback, it uh, was really useful to the gynaecology team for being able to redesign that service even uh, before uh, we've moved to the beard. Um, and then if we move on, uh, please, Lauren, to the SANS. Um, this is quite an important, uh, probably for me, the most important relationship I think we've built up uh, over the beard. So the Stillbirth and Neonatal Death Society we've engaged with since the very, very early days of the project. Um, the beard is quite a complex building that's bringing together maternity services where thankfully the majority of families have a very happy, delightful, uh, positive experience, but it's not always the case uh, for everybody. So we needed, we've given our architects quite a challenge to bring together one in one building uh, various uh, patient experiences. And the SANS, um, our SANS friends actually now, uh, have actually worked with us uh, since the early days of the project as to how were we going to, in such a busy building, uh, create um, a good service and positive experience for as positive as it could be for uh, families going through uh, the distress of a bereavement. Um, we had SANS in those early 2015 workshops that Lauren spoke about. It was quite a tricky relationship at the start. They're very invested in the Rubus Law Ward model that we have just now in the maternity hospital, which is great, but it took a bit of time and collaboration and discussion with them to realise 
we were all wanting the same thing to keep the excellent clinical uh, service and bits of rubisaw that we have just now but actually make it even better in the beard and we've gone from a two out of ten at the start of the process to now they've given us about a nine out of ten so but it's taken quite a bit of time to get there and it's actually all the richer and a much better relationship for it and um, we now have the image you're seeing there is a terrace uh, where the final design that sans have completely influenced every aspect of it is we now have two birthing rooms as part of a dedicated uh, annex uh, which will be called the rubislaw suite two birthing rooms and then they each have access to these private terraces i'm convinced actually had we not had sans involved uh, our staff as brilliant as they are would have missed uh, this important aspect of what families told us which was they wanted um, they and their, them and their baby to be able to experience a bit of fresh air uh, when they were going through that bereavement process. So that's uh, all credit to SANS that I don't not quite sure we'd have achieved uh, by ourselves. So it's given us that dedicated private space, the discretion of access and egress uh, from that uh, accommodation when they're actually ready to go home. That's all been achieved uh, with SANS input. Uh, and the way we've done that is various uh, methods with SANS. We've gone to them, we've had workshops, we actively participate in their fundraising activities because that's an added benefit there now, fundraising for the beard um, and built up a really good um, trusting relationship, I think, on both sides. We're actually now we wouldn't dream of doing anything uh, to this Rubisol seat without um, checking it was OK with SANS. Uh, so that's a, a good place to have got to, I think, after six years of working with them. And the next slide hopefully will show you um, one of our lessons learned we're going to feed back to you at the end is about we think it's important to celebrate the success of, of partnership working with stakeholders. So uh, just to brag there, we won the Celebrate Aberdeen Award in 2019 for partnership working. So that's members of the project team and SANS there. And we were absolutely delighted that uh, for SANS in particular, that they got that recognition of all the hard work they've given us to uh, help design the beard. OK, so next slide is um, another fun date work. Uh, we, uh, Lauren's already spoken about Orkney and Shetland, so we've been to Orkney and Shetland uh, twice now, uh, both islands, and this was uh, our youngest focus group. Um, these uh, young mums came to speak to us uh, about what was important to them, particularly coming such a distance to have a baby uh, in Aberdeen. Not always the planned route, uh, that they all, uh, in fact, out of these five mums, only one had planned to have a baby in Aberdeen. Um, but they were very complimentary about the clinical service. And what was important to them, clear as day, was uh, accommodation. They're coming to Aberdeen. They don't want to have to be worrying about where they're going to stay, where their partner is going to stay. So they were really reassured about our plans for the, the patient hotel. Um, so that was that was a great session, actually, to be sure we were right on the right track for providing uh, what Orkney and Shetland residents need. The second most important thing to them was Wi-Fi. Uh, so we've also been able, that's not um, available in the maternity hospital just now. So that was something else we were happy to reassure them that we will have in the beard. Uh, so that was a good day at work. And our next slide is just following on that theme about family accommodation. Uh, this is what we have just now in the maternity hospital so we've done the best we can with an old building but it's um not exactly welcoming uh, but it has given us a, another uh, opportunity where we've gone into the island accommodation as it's as it's called to speak to families and women in there again about what would be uh, beneficial and what they want to be seeing in the beard so that's given us another engagement opportunity and then the next slide will show you as you've seen fly through an idea of how hopefully the hotel accommodation will look in the beard and we're very lucky that there's uh, our main charity partner are uh, very keen to support that space so it will be um, uh, very luxurious and it's definitely an essential part of how the whole beard hospital uh, will work it's uh, not a luxury uh, and it's a free provision that's important uh, to say but we've had quite a bit of input from uh, Orton and Shetler residents, friends of the neonatal unit, we've a maternity voices partnership group, uh, we've had lots of input to what uh, people would think uh, they'd want to see uh, in a hotel and actually unfortunately we do have ha had some examples over the years of families um, where they can't get accommodation um, in the hospital currently as people have ended up sleeping in their cars, that's absolutely what we want to be avoiding. So not only we're we providing Nice accommodation we're providing, uh, more of it than uh, we have at the moment. Thank you. I'm going to stop now and we'll go on to 
uh, Anchor, and Louise is going to explain to you about our engagement for the Anchor Centre. Thanks, Gail. Hi, I'm Louise Budge. I'm Service and Commissioning Project Manager. I'm quite surprised I actually managed to remember. For some reason, I have mind freeze on my job title for the last seven years. Um, Lauren is going to take us through the virtual tour of the Anchor Centre, the same way as we did for Baird. So Carolyn Anand is our project nurse, she'll do the intro and then, like Gail, I will speak rapidly over the rest of the fly through. If I do speak too fast, I'm sure there'll be translators somewhere on here who will manage to maybe work out what I'm trying to say. Thank you. Hello, my name is Carolyn Anand and I am the project nurse for the Anchor Centre. It is my pleasure to introduce this fly through which will illustrate the main design features of the new Anchor Centre facility and will give viewers an indication of the overall environment we will create to benefit patients, families and staff. The Anchor Centre will bring radiotherapy, oncology and haematology together as well as providing the aseptic pharmacy suite for NHS Grampian and dedicated teaching and non-clinical accommodation. We are very proud of the design that has been achieved in collaboration with our stakeholders, including patient, charity and staff representatives. This building will support patients and families going through challenging times, so it was essential to include input from patients to achieve the final design. We are creating a welcoming building that is friendly and non-clinical where possible, with the aim of soothing anxieties that may be felt as you walk through the front door. I do hope that you enjoy this fly through and on behalf of NHS Grampian and the project team, thank you for watching. So this is our anchor centre. Maybe, no, here we go. So um, the, Gail has spoken, so just to know there's no competition in our project that Gail's building is five times the size of mine. I like to refer it as mine, it's not mine, it's patients, but that's just how I am. This is the anchor centre, the white blob in at the back is the existing radiotherapy centre, which is what Lauren referred to earlier on. So this is part two. The, we have had lots of consultation about it and we, our main charity has been Friends of Anchor who have generously allowed us to have patient staff engagement groups with them, patient consultation. I'm not very sure, but do you know that there's five million shades of orange um, and we eventually got the right one. This is our waiting area, which will be split up into different spaces for exactly for people who want a quiet space rather than just the standard um, waiting rooms that you see with lots of chairs and rows. And then we have sub waiting areas in Anchor Centre so that you'll come into your main waiting area, move through to a sub waiting area before you go through then to your consultation room on the ground floor and then our treatment suite on the first floor. This is one of our con existing con um, new consulting rooms, which is a far cry from our existing consulting rooms. They are 16 and a half square metres, spacious, and our, our interior design has been very good at giving it lots of colour. This is the other part of our waiting space, which will, as the Arnold says, attach us through then onto the radiotherapy suite, so that it all becomes one area. We take a lovely fly through up the up the stairs, um, run up there then to the treatment suite and um, anybody who I'm going to have a cut out of this man at the top of the stairs. Um, it's always in your own hello. That's how it will be when you come up here. It goes to show how this has changed from our original one to what our final one will be. This is our treatment space, our treatment suite where people will receive their chemotherapy. The chairs are different to what we've got here, but it's a wide open space, lots of light. We've then done huge consultation around with members of staff and patients about what they want when they're in that space. This is a treatment room that we've got upstairs. It's a new part that we don't have at the moment. Some of our treatments need to take place in our inpatient areas. Now it'll take place outpatient. And this is our complementary therapy room. I say ours, it's not. It will be run by our Friends of Anchor Charity Partnership. And here is the terraces. Hold on to that image of that lovely terrace, which was done on a Mediterranean day. And um, my next slide when I come on to it, you'll explain, we'll explain a bit more. This is our anchor centre as well, so that we can see the outside coming in so that there will be lots of five terraces. So you'll be able to access some of them, but not all of them. 
for various reasons. And here we go. Yeah, that's really fast, really fast. I'm very sorry. Um, I've just really run through that. Oh, dear me, I'm not used to that. So Lauren will take us to the, before she takes us, yeah, that one. No, 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 go back up, go back up, go back, that one there. So hands up anybody who knows an alternative word for seagull. You didn't have to tell me, but if you know an alternative word for seagull, Please stick your hand up now. If there's no hands go up. I'm going to be really disappointed. There's no hands going up. OK, Lauren, on you go. Pop it down. Oh, somebody, there we go. Emma, I'm sure you only know because you were there at the briefing beforehand. So here is my strap line. It's called Scotties and Toilets. There we go. So for various reasons. I'm originally from Wick. We call them Scotties. We're not posh. We don't call them seagulls. We call them Scotties. There we go. There's a love heart from somebody for a Scotty. The reason this is here is this is one of the two main things that has come through from consultation. Um, the Scottis actually is in, in relation to the terraces. We have lovely terraces. They will be achieved through fundraising monies. But in order to maintain our lovely terraces, we also have to have consultation on the size of the pebbles that you put in the terraces to stop the Scottis from nesting. Uh, I was speaking to our clinical lead about this yesterday, who then burst my wee bubble thinking that we'd managed to resolve it about the size of pebbles for scories by telling me now that the oyster catchers will come instead. So we want to maintain our terraces, which is very important to our patients. On that first floor in the treatment space, some people will be there for five, six, seven, eight hours getting chemotherapy, and we want to be able to allow them to come out and get some fresh air. The anchor centre is south facing, so it means that they will be able to enjoy some sunshine. We were very clever and we thought we, thought we were being really clever, really smug that we'd managed to do all of this until we went to one patient group who said that's lovely, really nice that um, you can sit in the sunshine, but I've, we've got skin cancer and we don't want to have direct sunlight. Now we have one of the terraces which will be covered with pergola, which allows them still to have enjoy the fresh air and the sunshine, but not directly um, onto their skin directly. Toilets. Anybody, I'll ask you anything and I will always tell you about toilets. Gail and I went to a men's vision breakfast in July 2016, where we were discussing all the aspects of the centre. There are menace and my husband was savage. Yeah, well, that won't happen in Anchor Centre because we'll have pebbles and the scories won't be able to do anything about it. So they're not getting on the building at all. We went to the men's vision breakfast, which was hosted by Friends of Anchor, who are the, they're very prevalent charity already in Anchor Services. And they are very keen to make sure that we do patient engagement. And we were chatting with them and showing them the plans for the building. And the guidance that comes tells you how many toilets you should have for patient staff, etc., per square metre for the building. And we had achieved this. And then a young gentleman who was maybe in his late 20s said it's great. But again, the I was in for seven hours and during that time I went to the toilet 25 times. In one trip, he was there for 25 times. And at that stage, we only had two toilets. Of those 25 times, he also had to provide a urine sample each time he went. So we have now improved it that there are now four toilets and on each toilet, um, it also links through to a dirty utility room, but they don't know it's a dirty utility room. There's a hatch and it, you can open the hatch, you can put your specimen sample through, close the hatch, it's privacy, it's dignity, it means nobody's wandering around with anything, it means nobody's waiting to go into the toilet. So scories and toilets, uh, is a strap line for me for anchor engagement for this particular slide. Lauren, thank you. So during our consultation, we didn't just stay local and um, we didn't just go to Lorkney and Shetland either, even though that's close to home for me, it was very nice to do so. Uh, we have also for both buildings been across the entire country um, to look at different facilities, different spaces, <laughs> And this particular one here was with Teenage Cancer Trust and it was at the Beetson Centre in Glasgow. We, the Anchor Centre will provide a dedicated space for the 16 to 24 age group, which we don't currently have at the moment. And when we had done lots of visits and research and everything around this particular age group, we, um, everything that we saw had jukeboxes and pool tables and gaming stations and everything that you anticipate that age group would look for. We went and met with these this team on a Tuesday. Tuesday night was Domino's night, it was pizza night. 
um, and they were quite simply outstanding, absolutely amazing. And we asked them at the end, we had said, what's most important to you? And they said, Lisa and a table. So Lisa is the little one at the front who is who was their youth worker and a table. What they felt they needed was a table that they could all sit around like a family meal, family time, and they can chat with people who get and understand what they're going through because their family at home don't understand it. They're not going through it, so they need one so they can have it as like minded people around them and just chat. Our um, teenager and young adult lounge in the anchor centre will have a table. Um, it will be a table that can fold up, can fold down. It can do a multitude of things. They can chat um, or they can do craft. They can do different facilities, different examples of things. They can do all around that table, which allows them to be comfortable enough then um, to speak about what's going on for them. Oh, that's my timer. That's my 10 minutes because I will speak long, 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 long. Um, what I will say is we went then locally to Maggie's beside us who might had a consultation with our own age group um, our own focus group there for that patient group as well and we had the consultation around a table so the, after they decided that they wanted to redesign the entire room completely um, we then did say though no you can't do that but so they came away with we need a table so it doesn't matter where you go in the country for this particular age group they still came back saying they needed a table thank you Thanks, Louise. I think it's now back to me. You're off the hook and you stuck to your time. I'm well impressed. I know. It's not like me. <laughs> um, so again, I'm going to take you through some lessons that we've learned along the way. And um, Gail and Louise, feel free to chip in because uh, obviously you've been you know, around all of these things as well. So um, some of our lessons that we've learned is to, like I say, constantly reviewing our strategy and methods. So we do we've done that the life cycle of the project that i spoke about the skim guidance we've done that at every stage um we make sure that we're reviewing all our strategies making sure that are the methods that we're using are they still working um is there anything new that we should be trying and um, so social media has is one method that has grown a lot um in the the life of the project um and it's it's a great tool now that we use for our communication and it's one of our main tools that staff and patients and stakeholders use because it's a great way of us being able to get the most relevant information out um, and it's obviously instant um, and so our, our reach um, and coverage um, with social media has been really valuable. We need the whole team input, like I've said, not just the engagement person. Obviously, I am the communication and engagement lead for Baird and Anchor, but it's not just my job. Um, there's it's such a huge project. There's been so much engagement and communication. So for you know, one person couldn't do it all um, and it needs the whole team to input into this and take responsibility for it. And I think it's worth noting there as well. It's also worth, you know, like I said previously, when you start out, if people haven't done engagement before, it's about realising the time that doing good engagement can take. Um, but it, we find that it has definitely been a worthwhile experience um, for the team and the project is much richer. And I feel the buildings are going to benefit greatly from all of the consultation work that we've done. Um, select methods that work best for your stakeholders. So like I've said, um, you know, if it doesn't work, change it. So when we changed our communication and engagement group, we obviously were asking people to come to us and then that wasn't working out for them. So we go to go to our stakeholders now um, and making sure that, you know, it, even though it's more time consuming for you to do, making sure that whatever method you're using works best for the stakeholders um, because, you know, they're the ones, it's our job to do it. They're the ones that are giving up more of their time. So making sure it works best for them is really important. <clears throat> Taking people on the journey with us and meaning it. Um, so obviously, um, Louise and Gail and I have all mentioned um, that there's been stakeholders involved since the beginning. And there is the Friends of Anchor, SANS, um, Archie Foundation. They've all been on this journey with us. And we, as Gail mentioned, some of the relationships, you know, weren't the easiest to begin with, but we have put in the effort and we've really built relationships over the years and when things might not have gone to plan we have had that relationship there 
and they've been on the journey with us so it was almost easier to explain why there was delays for example so making sure that our stakeholders have really been part of the team has been um a really important part of everyone's journey i think that's been involved in baird and anchor be knowledgeable and passionate about your project hopefully uh, you will hear from us today that we are so passionate about delivering these buildings um, and we really believe that although you know when we're having a tough day at work that we're doing the right thing and that these buildings will make such a huge difference to our staff and to the patients that will use them um, again correct team member for your audience that's something as well um, in terms of staff sometimes um, we We'll go and present at medical committees and things. So quite often we'll use our we'll ask, well, use ask our um, our um, clinical team to attend these, um, just in case there's any clinical questions. So our clinical lead or our project nurses will go. So making sure that you've got your your right person is going to the right audience, basically. Manage expectations in areas of influence. I think um, it's easy to get caught up at the start of a project and say, yes, you can have anything you want. <laughs> and then you we get reined back in and was like, we realise that no, actually, we can't have anything we want. And um, so again, with stakeholders, managing expectations and being clear about the areas that a stakeholder can influence, because obviously we're we're deliver these are health buildings. So there is certain things in terms of health of buildings that we have to have to be designed in a certain way so it's making sure that we were clear um that what areas people could actually influence uh, follow through and celebrate success i think we're all really good at doing the day job and just getting our head down and getting finished one task and getting on then on to the next thing but it's really important to reflect and celebrate the success so obviously gail mentioned about us winning the celebrate award with um sans so i think it's you know, really good to put yourselves forward for awards and things like that to recognise the good work um, and the good partnership work that's going on. Again, um, Gail and Louise mentioned about giving back, about fundraising. We try um, and work closely with our charity partners to attend their fundraising events, whether some of the project team raise money themselves or whether it's um, in an official capacity, going and speaking to donors, anything that they ask us to do, we will always try and support, or even if it's going, I know Louise and Gail have volunteered at um, Friends of Anchor events and things before. So it's being prepared to give back. I think that's really important to make sure that it's a two-way, you know, it's a two-way relationship. Educate the design team, um, that engagement is essential. Laughing at that, Louise put that in. <laughs> so obviously we are sometimes the middle, we're the middle people between the people that we're engaging with and the design team and the design team have a job to do and they just want to go on and design the building so it's again about reining them back in and explaining why we need to take the time to engage and why it is essential and I think we'd all agree that we have a much better building because of the engagement work and because we spent so much time in the early years doing the engagement work. This is also Louise. Think consult enough. No, <laughs> is it not you? No, it was Gail. Both was of them. It Gail? <laughs> <laughs> it's because Louise always speaks about offices. That's why I thought it was her. So poor Louise and Gail um, have done years of speaking to our staff about office space. And it's open plan offices that um, the buildings have and it's still a bone of contention. So when you think you've consulted enough, do some more. And our engagement will continue throughout our commissioning um, phase, which we're starting to think about just now. So obviously we'll commission the buildings um, over the next year and, and into 24, uh, 2024. Um, but we're starting our commissioning planning has already started. So we are making sure that we're having engagement to, to produce these commissioning plans, first of all, so that staff are involved and know exactly what um, will need to happen and then obviously there'll be a whole communication and engagement plan around the commissioning plan as well to support it and like I mentioned previously we'll also do post project evaluation so once we've finally um, move into both buildings we then go back and speak to staff speak to patients speak to families again to see if the buildings have achieved what we aimed for them to do and I am, um, as I've said a couple of times, it all takes time, but it is enjoyable and it's absolutely worth it. And it gives us um, 
the consultation has given us the confidence that we're delivering buildings that will be beneficial to patients, women and families than any, anyone else than staff as well who will obviously use the buildings. Is there anything else Louise or Gail would like to add? Uh, there's just one more slide, uh, yeah. Lauren, that I hope just kind of sums oh, it yes. up. Uh, um, uh, I'll, I'll happy to speak to that because I stuck it in. It was just to try and sum it up in a picture, really, that actually uh, there's uh, we had a turf cutting ceremony. So part of celebrating success and, uh, and thanking your stakeholders for their input is it, we could have had the great and the good on the shovel for the turf cutting ceremony but no we thought it was right that we had stakeholders it, it helped us doing it so there's um a woman there who's had experienced the breast service uh, and the blonde lady on the right is our uh, fiona our sans uh, chair so i was particularly pleased uh, we got sans in there so they were chuffed to bits to be asked to do it and it, it was absolutely the right thing to do because it's as much uh, uh, their building as ours so i suppose our uh, to try and sum it up your health building notes if you're working on a capital project will tell you what you should have lose is the perfect example uh, but actually do you know what your patients and your staff will tell you what you need uh, so it's uh, absolutely critical that you get that right stakeholder uh, input and uh, um, we're absolutely convinced our buildings are uh, all the better for it so that was just to try and sum that up thank you I'm just a final plug um, our, for our social media channels. So we've got a dedicated project website that you can go and find out more um, about the project. Um, and there is um, updates about the construction work. So obviously, the Baird and Anchor are both building sites at the minute, so you can actually go and see um, images of what stage the buildings are at. But also, if you follow our social media, then you'll get regular updates that way as well. And we're happy to take any questions. Thanks, Lauren. There was one question from my colleague Louise. She was just asking, have you been able to introduce any changes that you've been able to make now in response to the feedback within the current facility? Um, I'm, I'm happy to start on that one. I did see that coming in. That was a really uh, good question. Um, thinking about the maternity hospital, Louise might have examples for anchor. Uh, for the maternity hospital, we're obviously a wee bit limited uh, with the constraints of physical space, but there, there have been a couple of things that have been done. There, there's service redesign going on. So, for example, uh, the service have introduced a dedicated triage service that they didn't have before that we will have in the beard. So that's from the clinical point of view. We're preparing and doing as much in advance of moving as possible because the move itself will be a little bit stressful. Uh, so we want to get these service redesigns in place before then. But thinking about um, patients and families, uh, we um, have uh, only three transitional care rooms in the neonatal unit just now, and we will have 10 in the Baird. Uh, so uh, the service have uh, commandeered some ward space uh, in AMH to create more transitional care rooms. Uh, so that that's definitely going to improve. It is already improving uh, that facility to families. And the other thing that I think the, the project's had a little bit of input to, but actually it's more more the service. has been feedback of the maternity hospital. You go in the front door, there's one front door at the maternity hospital. You go in the front door, and this is a colloquial kind of description, but you turn left for bad news. If your baby's quite ill in the neonate unit or you're going to the Rubus Law Ward where you might experience a, a bereavement, you turn right to go to Labour Ward and the wards. So it's that, that was direct feedback from uh, women that, that's the way the building was built, wasn't it? That's obviously what we have uh, very much uh, designed the beard to absolutely not replicate, and we've got that discretion uh, and options. Uh, but what the service have done is um, they've uh, opened up uh, a, a side door, which is, allows that separation uh, of patient flows. So that's something we're, we're not taking credit for as a project team. It's something the service have done now uh, to try and improve it and um, have that uh, more appropriate separation of of flows that will be replicated in the beard. I don't know, Louise, if there's any anchor examples um, you want to talk about. I think mostly ones that, that they've managed is around your treatment chairs. So you'll have seen in the fly through that we've got lots of space around the treatment chairs on the first floor. Um, at previously in, in haematology especially that you could literally touch a person next to you when you were getting treatment um, so there was very little privacy dignity and everything around that they've moved through due to covid they've moved to different areas and when they've moved to a different area 
um, they've now actually spaced the chairs out a bit more. It still will not be representative of what it will be when we go over, but it's definitely bringing back that it bring taking on board that patient feedback that we've had already uh, that we need more space. So that's a bit of one thing I could think that they've managed to do now um, in anticipation of moving to anchor. Great, thank you. That's really useful to hear. Um, our colleague Lucy from Greater Glasgow and Clyde, she was just thanking you for the presentation, but she was saying she was wondering, and um, you said you mentioned that the first year of engagement was about having, you know, a, a kind of year of conversations. And she was asking, with such a large scale capital project, how is this open approach balanced with managing expectations and areas of influence? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose um, we went into that first year. It 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 was our project director uh, Jackie, who's done many capital projects, who set it up that way. And I think that came from experience from other projects. Um, and some of us were were brought into project from day one, but we're new to these sort of things. So we just kind of went into it with no thinking about influence or stakeholder analyses and things like that. That I suppose came a little bit later. It was fairly. I, I suppose um, we didn't go into these workshops with any constraints in our head. We just, we some of us were a wee bit anxious about, oh, why are we having patients and staff and women and the same thing? How's that going to work? Are people going to feel constrained in what they say and all that? But and, and we were helped that we were, it was all facilitated by uh, healthcare planners who've done this many times before and helped navigate through any uh, any tricky parts of making sure everybody was working to the same goal. Um, so it actually worked really well. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question at all, it, but that first year we were lucky that that was built into the programme. Actually, we, we had time pressures, obviously, but we had most of that first year to have those discussions and create those written clinical briefs and aspirations for what we wanted from the service that had patient and staff input. But I don't think we actually used any um, influence or stakeholder analysis restrictions to really kind of restrict how we did that. I'm not sure if that answers your question uh, at all, but that's kind of that's how we how we approached it. It was fairly open discussions. And as I say, absolutely things have come through that still to this day are quite emotional when you think about uh, mm. um, families and parents in particular sharing experiences in those mm. workshops that made even Clint Hart, you know, really experienced clinical staff stop and think, yeah. oh, wow, I'd never yeah. thought of that, actually. We were just thinking, yeah. you want a Bonnie Ward. We'd never mm -hmm. think about the fact you'd want a terrace. And a, a, yeah. an example I didn't give was we've got a terrace for um, a, a palliative, there's a room in the needs unit that will be used for palliative care. And that, again, came directly from families saying uh, they wanted in that uh, experience to have uh, their baby experience in fresh air. Uh, so that's another... Mm -hmm. um, a direct example of I think we might not have thought of that without yeah, their input. Absolutely. There were so many comments if you get a chance to look at the chat afterwards, Gail, Lauren and Louise, just people really reflecting about, you know, how you've worked people to co-design it, the influence people have had in the design. And I think people are commenting on the fact that what may perceive to be a little thing actually has a really big impact on a person's experience. Uh, Lucy, you'd asked that question. I just noticed you had your hand up. Did you want to ask a supplementary question or come in or oh thanks Emma sorry I was just gonna say um thank you very much for answering it um it was I think I was thinking along the lines of you know it's such a sort of huge undertaking in terms of you know a big clinical building and then there's all these codependencies and things that have to be within so many minutes of other you know services mm -hmm. And then, like you're saying, that real kind of personal story that you're getting from people and wanting to balance the two, but not look like you're trying to fit one into the other or prioritise one over the other, I suppose. So yes. it is, it's that idea of what you were saying there about those, you know, you're going to have your restraints from your, you know, your sort of guidelines, but then you're going to have what the patient actually needs as they're going through that and the families need as they go through it and getting that kind of balance right so I was really quite interested in that kind of thing so I think um, it's that time that you've talked about though in terms of letting that conversation happen maybe yeah Gail can I just jump in for an anchor there um so I, th I think Lucy what we've found is that when you're honest um with patients and you're honest with staff and members of the public 
when they come and ask why you can't do that. And I think when you're honest and you explain it rationally, um, yeah. as opposed to just, well, it's just not happening, that's just no way it is, then I've found certainly on the anchor side, that's made a big difference, just be, being open and transparent with them. Um, and because we've involved them so much along the way, and as Lauren and Gail have said, we've continued that relationship, um, then I think that makes a big difference because they can see, and you can also plot through things that you might have had in day one after a workshop and then how it shifted as a building's gone on for whatever reason and we have managed to do that certainly much more so in Baird because of the size of it but things that have changed in what originally we might have thought we needed um, and clinical accommodation and actually how it shifted into something else we needed more in support accommodation um, and I think certainly for just the size of the consulting rooms and everything and how we changed our office into a clinical room so that it would give patients more consultation space um, and when you explain that to patients then it actually helps um, certainly from anchor side of view anyway and there's huge, I think there's numerous ones um, on Baird uh, but I'm conscious people are, are dropping off because we said it was an hour but Sorry, um, thank you it does work be honest be open with them Thank and you. Any constraints, and it's a public service. So. Okay. Yeah, there was a there was also um, a question from Paul um, from Falker for Fally. He was just asking about how you know wondering about getting engagement with the kind of wider public and you know patients, women and families. This case in the in the earlier stages, the business case and kind of how you tackle that. And he was, I suppose, reflecting on that. You know, it's sometimes hard to engage people when you don't have those visuals and have those things um, to engage with people. Um, yes, yes, because certainly in the early days we did um, open sesh community sessions, uh, and you know there wasn't good good quality input, but not not great attendance because it was early days and it was it, you know we we're still planning it. I think now we've got things like the fly through, um, and uh, we do go out. Uh, to community groups. I was speaking to a church group just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we are open to speak to anyone. We keep saying that. People just need to invite us because the three of us could chat for Scotland. Uh, and, we're, and we're really passionate about it. And I think in some respects, our buildings and the services going there, it's kind of easy to see why we would be passionate about it. And some other projects, they might not seem as exciting if you're trying to get stakeholder input. But it's a fairly easy sell, actually, really, in terms of um, of, of being passionate. And we've got that charity input as well. But actually, we it is the best part of the job. It's time consuming. Uh, we're absolutely convinced it's the right thing to do, uh, not just um, because we've got a better design for it, but it, it's the right thing to do. Uh, but we do enjoy it. And I think Lauren said, you know, if you've had a hard day at work, you do something like this and it just reminds you what we're um, actually there to do uh, and what we're spending £233 million pounds, uh, to do. It's not just about a bonny building at the end of it. Mm -hmm. It's about Absolutely. improving services. Yes, yeah. lots of comments. Thank you so much. Um, I think that was the the last question. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll let you read, but thank, thank you, you so much. Thank, thank you so much. Thank Thanks for your time. Presenting today. And although some have dropped off, I think it's testament to the, the quality of what you've given us today that there are others who are hanging on beyond the hour, so we're really grateful for your time. Um, just reflecting on the brief, you absolutely nailed it. Stakeholders <laughs> over architects, that came kind of flooding through. I had a slight concern that you might see a bit of a population boom in Grampian when you were showing the new maternity services unit, but everything just looked fantastic. Um, Emma, nothing else in the chat box you wanted to pick up before we close? No, just to say, if you get the chance to have a look at the chat, there's just so many, there's lots of, you know, great points and feedback. I think people really supporting your approach and I'm um, really thankful for you sharing your, your experiences today. And I think a really useful reminder for us all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So for, for those that are still on the call, our next webinar will be covering the Citizens Panel Report. This is the eighth report being published tomorrow which will be available on the HIS Community Engagement website. And as I said at the beginning, if you wanted to be kept up to date with what's coming up, then just keep in touch or follow us on Twitter. But thanks very much for your time today. And special thanks to our guest presenters for giving up their time. And um, really, really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. And have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all.